Okay, everybody, good to see you here. Let's begin with prayer. Father, we thank you for this lesson on your promises. Let it be an encouragement to our hearts. Let us leave closer to you than when we came. Open our minds, open our hearts to understand and accept your word. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so now on this new computer that I'm using, I'm going to share my screen. All right. Okay, this lesson is on children of the promise. And I highlighted the word promise because in this particular lesson, while we are still studying the covenant with Abraham, the concentration is on the promises that God makes to us. And the fact that um, it's filled with promises, this lesson should, should have us leaving this study feeling encouraged that God really loves us and he has made so many promises to us. At the end of Sabbath afternoon's lesson gives us an overview of what we should be studying. This week at a glance, we want to come away knowing why God referred to himself as Abraham's shield. Then we wanna know how were all the families of the earth to be blessed through Abraham. And then we wanna look into the greatest of the covenant promises. Let's begin with the memory verse. And the memory verse says, Lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Now, this is coming from Matthew 28, verse 20. So we know God wasn't speaking directly to Abraham. This is Matthew telling us something that Jesus said. But Jesus saying this reminds the people that God promised this in the covenant with Abraham. That God would be with us, his chosen people, the people who decide that they want to accept his offer to be in an agreement with him, in a covenant with him. And so this text kind of highlights the most important part of the covenant. That God will be with us always, even unto the end of the world. The story, the um, lesson starts with a story, but I'm going to skip it and come back to it if we have time. If we have time, we'll come back to that story. So I want to go straight to Sunday's lesson thy shield. In Genesis 1, verse, um, verse 5, we have this text. After these things, the word of the Lord came into Abram in a vision, saying, Fear not, Abram, I am thy shield and thy exceeding great reward. So this is a promise. One of the promises that's a part of the covenant. I'm your shield. I'm your reward. Don't be afraid. So what would Abram have to be afraid of? What would Abram have to fear? Anybody have any ideas? What would Abram have to fear that God would have to say to him, don't be afraid, I'm your shield. 
Well, God asked him to move, and he went to a land uh, where there were strangers. He didn't, and he didn't even know where he was going. He's going to a land that has strangers. The land itself is strange. Sometimes we're afraid of people, but sometimes we're afraid of the elements, the land itself. What is it going to be like? What's the atmosphere going to be like? But that's why God says to him, don't worry about that. Don't be afraid of that. I'm going to shield you from the things that you fear. I will be a sheer shield. And what's particularly interesting here is that the Lord says to Abram, I am thy shield. There are several texts in the Bible, and we'll read some of them where someone else, for instance, David says, the Lord is my shield. There are times when um, the writer of that, that book of the Bible says, God is our shield. But here God is saying it himself to Abram, who later is Abraham. He says, I am your shield. That is so different. When somebody promises you something, if somebody else has to tell you, you know that your friend made a promise to you. But when the friend promises himself or herself, it makes a difference. It shows the personal nature of the relationship. God is saying to Abram, I'm going to relate to you one-on-one. -on -one. He's saying that to us too. That same promise, because we know that everything he promised Abram or Abraham, he's also promising us. When God calls himself someone's shield, what does that mean? Did it mean something to Abram that it might not mean to us now? Can we claim that promise for ourselves? What does it mean? Does it mean no physical harm will come to us? In what ways is God a shield? How do, if somebody want to share, how do you understand that? I was thinking about that mission story we just heard and thinking about in, in my life, in, our, in the life of my family, it seemed that just a few years ago, we had 13 people to die within two years in our family. And, and I remember Doris went through something too. It seemed like there was a period when a lot of people in Doris's family passed away all within a short time. Yes. And we are Christians and some of those people who passed away were close to God. Was, was he shielding them? What does it mean? When God says, I am your shield. And did it mean something different to Abraham than it might mean to us? Anybody want to share? I thought, well, I think it means, oh, go ahead, Doris. I thought that maybe shield means uh, protector. You know, regardless of where we go or how far or the situation that uh, he would protect us. So that mean, does that mean we won't ever get in an accident or we won't ever die? What, what does that no. protection, what does that mean? I think it means he'll just be with us and comfort us if we need that but he's always there no matter what we're going through. Great. Because protection, I'm thinking when Dara says protection, you know, there are some people when things happen, they commit suicide or they just give up or they abandon life and hide under uh, some kind of hermit-like shelter and they don't enjoy anything. 
pr protection may not mean we won't have problems, we won't have um, harm come to us. Sometimes we get hurt. Sometimes we even pass away. But if we were in Christ, that's not the end of life. It's a break, it's a period of sleeping, but he's gonna be with us through eternity. And so that's not the ultimate thing that can happen to us. And even with um, the passing of a loved one, um, it's hard for a period of time, but when God is with us, he still comforts us. He, say, he brings people who can help us. That's, that's the shield, that's the protection that we still can feel like I can hold on and I can still find joy and life can still be meaningful. I might go through something, but with God as our shield, we're protected from just giving up. Anybody else? Okay. Christ has not a casual interest in us, but an interest stronger than a mother for her child. That is strong. Most of us have been mothers. Those of us who haven't been mothers, we've been aunts, <laughs> we've been teachers, we've been close to somebody. And when there's somebody you're close to, especially someone who's younger, who's depending on you, whose shield you are. And Christ's interest in us is even stronger than that. Our savior has purchased us by human suffering and sorrow, by insult, by reproach, by abuse, mockery, rejection, and death. He went through all of that. He's watching over you, trembling child of God. He will make you secure under his important word, protection. Our weakness in human nature will not bar our access to the heavenly father. For Christ died to make intercession for us. It just, there's so much that he gives us if we will take it and be a part of this covenant. Now, this whole lesson has to do with promises. So that first one was the promise of him being a shield. He's gonna protect us. The next part, this, this promise, in our lesson comes in two parts, the messianic promise. The promise, messianic means Messiah, the Messiah. When God speaks to Abraham, he says, in thee and in thy seed shall all the families of the earth be blessed. All the earth, the whole earth. Well, how is that? How is everybody blessed through Abraham's seed? It is pointing directly to the coming of Christ. When Christ comes through the children of Israel, through Abraham's direct seed, those Abraham has Isaac, Isaac has Jacob, Jacob has those 12 sons that gives us the children of Israel, because remember Jacob's name is changed. And through them, Jesus comes. And then the New Testament, once Jesus comes, we're told, and if ye be Christ's, then ye are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Now, all people who accept Christ now are part of this covenant. Is it making sense? 
that everything that was promised to Abraham is promised to everyone who accepts Christ because by accepting Christ, we become Abraham's seed and heirs to this promise. All right. And I want to go to um, the end of, of this day. How do you understand the notion that Abraham, through Jesus, all the families of the earth would be blessed. So how are they blessed? What does that mean? How are they blessed? How are all, all people are blessed? Now, you know, the um, Orthodox Jews today, they think they're the only ones blessed. And there are some other religious groups who believe they're the only ones who are blessed. What is this saying? Sister Letty, are you trying to say something? Uh, no, I'm listening. How do you understand the notion hmm. that everybody is blessed? That was from the very beginning. Do you remember way back when it was just um, Adam and Eve, way back when we studied that first lesson, we found out that when they messed up, immediately God says, well, there's going to be enmity, a, a, a strife, a pull apart between Satan and the seed of Eve, of the woman. There weren't any Jews yet. He already said, there's going to be a way that through this woman's seed, Satan is going to have his head bruised. And so we know that all from the very beginning, the promise is going to be for everybody. Okay, um, let's move on. There's no question that the covenant promise of the world savior is the greatest of God's promises. That's the greatest. We have the promise of the shield, and then we have promise of a nation being great. And we have promises of our names being great. But the greatest promise is the promise of the Savior. What is it about the promise of eternal life? Sure, I'm at the right. What is it about the promise of eternal life in a world without sin and suffering? that has so much attraction for us. Could it, uh, it be? Sounds, Go ahead. It just sounds perfect. This world is so horrible that um, we just can't wait to be someplace else. So this is, this can't be all. There are some people who believe this is all. Mm -hmm. And that seems so hopeless. And to know that there's something else is just, uh, is just joyful. Could it be that we long for that something else, that joyful part? Because that's what we were originally created for. And that by longing for it, we're longing for something that is basic to our nature. We weren't created for yeah. death. We weren't created for all this sin. And so there's something in us that longs for that perfection that we'll never find in this world. Any other comments? Uh, 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 so, Scantu, I, I think that um, 
this longing uh, that we have to get, we really have to be deep in Christ and really, really love him because most, uh, I think a lot of people do all, a lot of things and try to get a lot of stuff. It's mm -hmm. what you just said. Uh, they think this is the end. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There is no more. You know, because they don't see the road or, or, or they don't see the place where they're going. Mm -hmm. So they think this is it and they and they try to get all they can right here. Yeah, and that leads right into the next day. Okay, so let's look at it. That's a perfect entrance into the Messianic Promise Part 2. Oh, one thing I do want to... No, I'll wait. I'll wait until we get to um, Wednesday. The Messianic Promise Part 2. This is what um, Dars is bringing us to. That if you don't understand or know about this covenant and about eternal life, then you'll try to find the joy, the comfort, the shield. You'll try to find the things that God is promising us with a covenant with him. But if you don't know about it and you don't enter into the covenant with him, you try to find joy and satisfaction and comfort and, and shielding protection in other things. And that's just what this messianic promise part two is about. So this uh, day talks about two people. The first one, it, there's a quote by Thomas Brown. Um, Thomas Brown was a British person who lived back in the 1600s. And he was just known for being um, a philosopher, a scholar, a writer. He was known in his day. And so when he said something, you know, people just clung to it. He, he's not a Bible writer, but just like today, there are people who say things and because we admire or we know about them, we admire them, then what they say lives on for years and years. For instance, we still talk about Abraham Lincoln and his Gettysburg Address. And there are other quotes that come to us from Abraham Lincoln. We admire him. He's a person closer to our times. Same thing with Dr. Martin Luther King. There's so many quotes that come from him. You know, if you make the best mousetrap, the world will make a beaten path to your door because you have something that's good. Well, this was a person like that in his time. But what he had to say um, affected many generations. So he says, this Thomas Brown, who's British, to enjoy true happiness we must travel into a very far country. In other words, wherever we are right now, we're always gonna come up against stuff that brings you down. There's always gonna be some kind of strife, some kind of problems. You gotta go on vacation. <laughs> you gotta go someplace to get away from it. And sometimes we do that. I went to um, Hawaii. And it was beautiful. But when I was in Hawaii on the television were some things going on that still brought the strife right back. <laughs> You're supposed to be getting away. But Thomas Brown says sometimes you have to even go out of ourselves. You got to go outside of yourself. He's alluding to something spiritual. He's talking about God, okay? So there are two Bible texts that help us connect to what Thomas Brown was saying. Look at the above quote that was written in the 1600s, the one we just read. And then let's read 1 Thessalonians 4, 6 through 18. And Miss Letty, would you look that one up? 
And then Doris, okay. would you go to Revelation 3.12? Let's look at those two Bible texts and see how they relate to what Thomas Brown was saying. First Thessalonians okay, this, 4, 16 through 18. Okay, this is from the NIV. Okay. For the Lord himself, for the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be with the Lord forever. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. Okay. And in the King James, it says, comfort one another. So this is, this is the Apostle Paul talking, inspired by God. And he's telling us there'll be a day when we'll be, we can be comforted now by knowing that there's coming a time when we will forever be with the Lord. We can comfort ourselves now just by knowing the promise of forever being with the Lord. Do you see how that connects to what Thomas Brown said? Sometimes we just have to go far away and even outside of ourselves. And it might be when we are forever with the Lord. And then Doris, read Revelation 3.12. King James Virgin, him that overcometh will I make a pillow in the temple of God and he shall go no more out. And I will write upon him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, which is new Jerusalem, which cometh down out of heaven from my God, and I will write upon him my new name. A new Jerusalem. We're being promised a new Jerusalem. And that's, that's giving us comfort also. So this messianic promise that was given to Abraham, it's reinforced to us today. Now let's look at, this is a part, look at, look at what um, Augustine says. I wanna tell you a little bit about who is this Augustine? He is another one of these uh, people like Thomas <clears throat> Brown, except Augustine, <clears throat> Anytime you start reading religious writing or um, if, if somebody decided to go to school for theology or you start um, studying the history of Christianity from the time that Christ went to heaven and then the apostles then started spreading the word. And then you get to the early years of Christianity, you run into Augustine. Augustine was a writer. He was a philosopher. He became a religious person in the third century, <laughs> third century. So Christianity has spread, all the apostles are dead and Christianity is now Catholicism. The first Christian church is the Catholic church. When Augustine, um, and he came from North Africa, I think like around, um, you know, that part, what is that part? I'm, I'm looking at the map of Africa, the North, the very Northwest, um, <clears throat> where you have a lot of Muslims today but before there were even Muslims, um, Christianity had spread to that part of North Africa and Augustine was living there. His mother had become a Christian, but in his early life, he denied God and he became an atheist. So in his very early life, but later as he became more mature, 
he embraced Christianity. And his writings, it's almost like we say today, you know, Shakespeare said this, or again, you know, uh, Martin Luther King said this. He wasn't a Bible writer, but he was considered um, a person who wrote truth. Now, look what Augustine wrote. Okay about this life of ours. He says, in this life of ours, there are dreadful abyss of ignorance. Some people are so ignorant. They just don't even know truth. And then error flows out of that. And I'm thinking of something, and I think Doris, you said it earlier that when we don't know things, we grasp onto other things to try to bring us comfort. And this is what, uh oh, let me get back to you. This is what he says we grasp onto. Look at these ignorant things. There's toils, there, there are tears, and there are fears. Our very love for some of these things that proves so vain and poisonous and breeds so many heartaches, troubles, griefs, and fears. And here's what some of them are. There's discord. You know how you get this tension and you start arguing with each other? There's strife and there's war. There's fraud, there's theft, robbery, perfidy and pride, envy, and ambition is homicide and murder, cruelty and savagery, lawlessness and lust, all the shameless passions of the impure, fornication and adultery, incest, unnatural sins, rape, and countless other uncleanliness too nasty to be mentioned. I mean, that grabbed me. Then there are the sins against religion, sacrilege and heresy, blasphemy and perjury, the iniquities against our neighbors, calamities, that's those be calamities, and cheating, lies and false witness, violence to persons and property, the injustices of the courts. Now, this is interesting. This is written by Augustine back in the third century. And he's talking about the injustices of the courts. And we just were happy, was it last week? Because finally, the court made a just decision in, in the George Floyd case. But we were surprised because we're so used to injustice and it was happening way back there. And innumerable and other miseries and maladies that fill the world yet escape attention. There is so much that can bring you down without the promise that this is going to be a better life. This is going to be a better time. This is going to be a better world. How could you make it without the messianic promise that God is our shield, he'll be with us, and that it's not just for Abraham's immediate seed, but we are inheritors of that promise? Look at all of the things that we can escape. Any, any comments? When you read that part, it has to, especially when he said some things too nasty to write. Back in the third century, I mean, how many things do we see today that are too nasty to write down that God is giving us an escape from those? Any comments? Yes, when I first heard that, I thought of our last uh, administration, the government, and so mm. many of those things happened. And here it says, 
yet escape attention. And I thought about all the people who called themselves Christians who just kind of winked at it. Mm-hmm. All the things that were going on that we all know were wrong. Yeah. As a matter of fact, that last administration, they're the ones who were very supportive of Donald Trump. He had, he had the evangelicals who were supportive of him. And even today, there are evangelicals who believe that um, other people were wrong to be so hard on Donald Trump. As a matter of fact, I don't know if anybody saw this, but I watched on TV, um, since Donald Trump has been out of office, he gave his first major speech at a conference of conservatives. And at the end of the conference, did anybody see that? Because I don't want you to think I made this up. What did they bring in as a gift to him? Anybody see it or remember? It was a golden statue of him, right? It was a golden image. They made, do you remember how the statue, the golden image of um, Nebuchadnezzar went after he decided that he didn't want to just be the head of gold. He wanted the whole statue to be gold. They brought in one of Donald Trump, a golden statue. I couldn't believe it. And I said, anybody who calls themselves religious would know what this is. How could they accept that? Any other comments or um, any thoughts? You know, what I think too is how could people live in this world with all of this stuff that Augustine pointed out? How, how, How do they find happiness in that stuff? And then I thought, a part of it is addictions and Satan is on the job. He gets people to be addicted to um, all of the stuff that's mentioned here so that it keeps them from being drawn drawn to God. That means we have a work to do. (laughs) We have a work to do. Anyone else? And another thing, those... uh, people who uh, don't see that all these things that's doing wrong and, and all this kind of stuff because they are one of them. It's half, half the things they doing themselves. That's why they don't uh, strike against it. Mm, mm-hmm. Yeah, when you're so deep into it and you're the one doing, you know, I'm looking at some of the stuff, you're the one who's so prideful and you're the one involved in the envy and the cruelty and the lawlessness. You're the one who's involved in the fornication and the adultery. You're so into it yourself that um, it's become comfortable for you to a point because all these things cause misery. Even the people who are in it, they're not happy then they're they're searching, they're getting deeper and deeper searching for the happiness, Um, but they're not happy. And you know what they say about addictions, whether it's a physical addiction or one of these other kinds, when you first start off smoking a cigarette or drinking, it just takes a little bit to give you that pleasurable feeling. But as time goes on, you need more and more and more of it. The amount you took in the beginning does nothing. You got to get deeper and deeper in the sin in order to feel like it's giving you any joy. Hmm. Wow. Okay. Fortunately, however tough our situation now, the future is bright but only because of what God did for us through the life, death, resurrection, and high priestly ministry of Jesus Christ, the ultimate fulfillment of the covenant promise 
made to Abraham that in his seed, all families of the earth will be blessed. You know, there's something, I, before we go on to the next day, I want to go back to 1 Thessalonians 4, 6 through 8, because this text, <clears throat> even though it's here for us to know that that eternal life is what comforts us. There was something else that was said there. And since this is new believers, I just want to bring it out because some of us who are here who are old believers. But if you notice in this, it says, um, and the, the last trumpet will sound and the dead in Christ will rise first. And those of us who are alive will be caught up with them in the air. And then we'll be forever with the Lord. But I don't want to just skip over that. Even though it doesn't fit this lesson right now, since the text is here, I just wanted to bring that out. The dead in Christ will rise first. So many Christians believe that those who were Christian, who had re a relationship with God, when they died, they went straight to heaven. So many people believe that. And you go to funerals and you'll hear the pastor saying, sister, so-and-so is looking down on us right now. Well, brother, so-and-so, even though he suffered on this earth, his illnesses are, are now gone and he's enjoying a new body in heaven right now. But this text, and this is only one, there are many texts and we won't go to them because that's not what the lesson is about. But this is not the only text that tells us when a person dies, whether they die in Christ or not in Christ, they are in the grave. Jesus calls it a sleep until this time that's talked about in 1 Thessalonians. When the trumpet of God shall sound and the dead in Christ will rise, they rise first. Why would they rise if they're already enjoying eternal life? They rise and we who are alive will join them and then we will forever be with the Lord. Any questions about that? even though it doesn't fit this lesson, but I didn't want to just let that go. The state of what happens when people die. This is one of the texts that tells us they must be in the grave, but there are other texts. And if anybody wants to ask me about that later, you can. Okay, so let's look at, um, a great and mighty nation. This is another promise that's in the covenant. Okay, now I didn't want to talk about all of it. So let's just go here. Why did the Lord make a special nation out of Abraham's seed? Did the Lord just want another country of certain ethnic origin? What purposes of this nation, what purposes did this nation fulfill? So before we read these texts, while we're looking for it, something I want to tell you about Abraham and how this Abraham seed and how this covenant begins. Um, so I'm going to ask Doris, can you look up Exodus 19? And you'll read five through six when we're ready. And then Sister Letty, could you um, read Isaiah 60 and read one through three? And Danny, are you still with us? I saw Danny pop in. Did he pop back out? Okay, I don't hear him. And so, um, Whitney, can you do De uh, Deuteronomy 4, 6 through 8? Sure. Okay. Now, before we read those, something, when we talk about this promise was um, 
for Abraham's seed. He wanted to make a special nation. So if you read um, a lot about Abraham, because we're getting deeper into him, when Abraham was getting older and he felt like, wow, you know, God promised me something, but my wife, you know, she's past childbearing age and I'm getting pretty old myself. I better go ahead. And, and Sarah actually suggested why don't you try to have a child with the maid? And so he did. <laughs> and um, and what was that maid's name? And what was that child's name? Who remembers? Hagar Ishmael. Hagar. He had a child with Hagar. And who was the child? Ishmael. Ishmael. And God said, uh-uh. Not, not, that's not the one. I want it to be Sarah C too. I want it to be you and Sarah, not Ishmael, who you got through Hagar. And did you know that even after Isaac was born, because that's the one that this seed comes through, but Abraham married again. So he had, before he had, he was married to Sarah. That was his first wife. That was what God considered his real wife. And then he married. Hagar, and he had a child. Then when Sarah died, Abraham married again. It's in Genesis 25, the verse one. Anybody know what her name was? I think it was Keturah. Keturah. And he had six children by her. But that's not the seed. That's not the one. The one that's talked about here is the bloodline that comes through Isaac to Abraham. And it doesn't get spread to everybody until Jesus comes. And that's when everybody, the whole world is blessed. But through the children of Israel, Jesus comes. So now, did the Lord just want another country? I mean, to be, you remember how um, in World War II, um, Hitler wanted a, a, a pure race. He wanted to get rid of all these other people who will spoil his race. And even here in the United States, if you had one drop of blood that was not European, then you weren't European because we want to keep that group pure. So um, is that what God is saying here? Because I think that some people might use this to try to say that God does like a pure race. He didn't want it to be Ishmael. He didn't want it to be Keturah's kids. It had to be the special seed that Abraham and Sarah produced. Then through Isaac came Abraham. And through Abraham came the 12 tribes. And through them, then came Jesus. And then it went to the world. So how does Abraham got get choose in the first place? Because the fact of the matter is that that is not important to God at all because mm -hmm. he chose the very lowest. And then throughout the Bible, we see in multiple places where God chose the least of, so to, to make them great. And so that's a great promise and an assurance for us that it doesn't matter who we are, where we came from, that God can take us right now, wherever we're at. Mm -hmm. And his promise, part of that, covenant that he has with us is that he can make us great praise the lord let's uh, thank you thank you let's look at these texts and see how they add because i think um it'll bring us right to where danny brought us exodus 19 5 through 6 who uh that's sister letty is that you uh, doris okay doris has that one now therefore if ye will obey my voice indeed, 
and keep my, my covenant when ye shall be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people for all the earth is mine and ye shall be <clears throat> unto me a kingdom a priest and a holy nation these are the words which thou shalt speak unto the children of israel okay so he chose them so that they could be a priest and a holy nation what do priests do priests spread the word he chose them to be the priests so that they could go out and spread the word go to um miss letty you have isaiah sister letty yes yes mm -hmm. uh, Isaiah 61 to 3. Arise, mm -hmm. shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord rises upon you. See, darkness covers the earth, and thick darkness is over the peoples. But the Lord rises upon you, and his glory appears over you. Nations will come to your light, and kings to the brightness of your dawn. This was said, Isaiah was giving a prophecy. And he's telling God's special people, he's actually talking about the time when they come out of their second captivity, when they're coming out of Babylon. And he says, your light has come. Nations are gonna come to you. Kings are gonna come to you. You know, I've given you information. You're the ones that I've, God has poured into you so that you can be the light. Not so that you can say, you know, we got special blood and, um, and we're better than other people. No, you weren't chosen for that reason. You were, you were a humble people, but I'm giving you so that you can give to others. And then um, Deuteronomy 4, 6 through 8, Whitney. All right, reading from the King James Version. Keep okay. therefore and do them. Can you read louder or get closer to your mic? Oh. Is this better? Yeah. Okay. Keep therefore and do them, for this is your wisdom and your understanding in the sight of the nations, which shall hear, I'm sorry, which shall hear all these statues and say, surely this great nation is a wise and understanding people. For what nation is there so great who hath God, who hath a God so near unto them as the Lord our God is in all things that we call upon him for? And what nation is there so great that hath statues and judgments so righteous as all this law, which I set before you this day? What are you hearing there? He chose a people that he could pour all this righteous law into, all these righteous judgments into, so that what could happen? other nations would see it and say, wow, look what they have. So why did he choose them? So that they could be proud and boastful and say we're better than everybody? So that they would no, be, they, go ahead. Oh, so they would be examples. They could um, lead other people to Christ. They could be the example. So now, Somebody read First People, First Peter, two nine. And while somebody, who's going to look that up? Um, I can. Okay. And while she's looking that up, here's what we're going to be looking for. Can we see any parallels? Because now we're in the New Testament, and now we are we the heirs to the promise. So can you see any parallels between what the Lord wanted to do through Israel and what he wants to do through our church? If so, what are those parallels? And let's read 1 Peter 2, 9 to see if we can see anything that Peter is saying. It sounds like what we read in those other texts. Right, I have it. But ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, 
a peculiar people that ye shall show forth the praises of him who have called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Okay. Get that so remember the others were called a priesthood. Yes. They were to be priests. The priests spread the word. We are now those priests. We were called out of darkness and we are given all of this good information so that we can spread it. We aren't given anything and we're not, and I think especially when Peter is talking, is he talking about Seventh-day Adventists right there in First Peter 2 and 9? Who's he talking, talking to? to all. He's talking to those who accept Christ, death and resurrection. Right. You, know, you know, there wasn't even um, Catholics yet because <laughs> the Catholic Church said Peter was the first Pope. But these are for those who accept Christ. Some, most of them were Jews who are now coming out of Judaism accepting Christ. And then there were Gentiles who were beginning to leave their old ways. And most of the Gentiles in those days had many gods. You know, the Greeks and the Romans had many gods. Now they're beginning to accept Christ and the idea of one God. So that group who was small in Peter's day compared to how many Christians there are today, they had a job to do, to go into the whole world and preach this gospel. And so we are to be, just as we inherit the promises that God gave to Abraham, we are to be the messengers. We are to do the work that God wanted Abraham's seed to do. Is it making sense? Okay, take that as a yes. Now, another promise was, I will make your name great and I will make of thee a great nation and I will bless thee. We already talked about that just um, on Wednesday and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. God promises to make Abraham's name great. That is to make him famous. Did God bestow greatness on Abraham for his own personal benefit? Or did it represent something else? Remember how we just talked about um, Thomas Brown, and we talked about Augustine, how so many years later, their names are great. We think about Dr. Martin Luther King, and we talked about names um, last week. That was a part of it. But we're going to read Genesis 11.4. And it, Genesis 12, 2, and see what is the difference between what is said in these two texts. In what ways do, does one of these say you're great because of your works? Or are you great because of your faith? Is it salvation by works? Salvation by faith. And we've had this so many times. It comes up over and over because it is a repeated struggle for many people. And it's throughout the Bible that we are saved by grace through our faith, not through our works. So um, can I get somebody to volunteer to read Genesis 11.4? And then somebody to volunteer to read Genesis 12, 2. I have 11, 4. Okay. I can do 12. Then they said 
Oh, you want it now? Um, well, who's going to take 12 2? Uh, Whitney, were you going to do that? Yes. Okay. So go ahead, um, Letty. Then they said, Come let us build ourselves a city with a tower that reaches to the heavens, so that we may make a name for ourselves. Otherwise, we will be scattered over the face of the whole earth. Hmm. That's a perfect example. These people were working to make their name great, and they said it. Let's do this so we can make our name great. Okay, that was that's a per. There's plenty of examples in the Bible, but that's a perfect one. Genesis twelve two. All right, reading from the King James Version, and I will make of thee a great nation, and I will bless thee and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. Okay, Jesus, God says, I'll make your name great. When we do, um, when we have a relationship with him and our faith is strong in him, he makes the name great. We don't make it great ourselves. It's not what we do to make ourselves great or to even earn our salvation. It's the relationship we have with God that he makes great and he saves us because of our relationship. Um, and there was something, let's see, did I highlight it? Okay, right here. Look at some of the men and women who have great names in the world today. Sometimes they're actors, sometimes they're politicians, artists. Sometimes they're great just because they're rich. What is it about these people that has made them famous? And then contrast that with the greatness of Abraham. What does it tell us about how perverted the world's concept of greatness is? We, we, well, even, you know, some people now, some people are famous and then some people are what we call infamous. <laughs> what, do, what does that word mean, infamous? Um, they're known for something that's negative. Yeah. They're actually great in that their name is well known because they did not do some good stuff. They did some terrible stuff. They're considered infamous, but, they're, but their names are still great. And um, I think of um, Charles Manson. Did he die recently? Didn't he just die recently? And his name- I don't know. I think he did. But he was in prison for a long time because of um, how he killed people and how he even had a family of uh, wicked and evil people who just killed for the sake of killing. Um, but then we have people who are great because um, of how they act and, and, and the movies that they make. And then we have people because they're so rich, we look up to them. Hmm. Do we have great people that we consider great within Christianity? I think Martin Luther King is one of those people. Martin Luther King and Martin Luther. Yeah. Because you remember Martin Whitney Luther. brought that out last week. Martin Luther King's father changed his name because of the greatness of the name Martin Luther, who he was. And you know what, something, um, when I think of Martin Luther, and because Augustine was in this lesson today, and, and a personal experience I had, and I think of it all the time, even though I was Adventist, um, when I really felt like I now get it, I now know the difference between salvation by works, salvation through grace, by grace through our faith. It's the book of Romans. I was um, 
one of the times when I decided I'm going to read the Bible all the way through. And when I got to the book of Romans, it is what really, really touched me. And I said, I get it. I understand. Because Christians, early Christians, and not just Adventist Christians, but many Christians felt like here are a list of things you must do to be saved. That the covenant says you do these things and I will save you. The covenant says I have already provided for your salvation. I already love you. I know you can't be perfect but you could have a relationship with me. When you have a relationship with me, I'll know because of what you will do. You'll do it because you have a relationship. That is made very clear in the book of Romans. When I was studying Martin Luther, the, he was a, a Catholic, um, priest, he says in his memoirs, it was the book of Romans. It's when he read the book of Romans that he realized he had to get out of this Catholicism. They had too many rules. And plus they had you pay money for salvation. They added stuff that wasn't even in the Bible. But it was the book of Romans that helped him to see it, to get it. And when I was reading and studying about Augustine, he was an atheist and then he became a Christian. It was the book of Romans. <laughs> and I thought, wow, that's, and then for me personally, it was the book of Romans. And so if you have any questions about salvation through grace, through our faith and salvation that you got to do this and you got to keep the Sabbath. See, because you because you do the right thing doesn't mean you're trying to earn your salvation. You do it because you have a relationship. We're down to two minutes. And so um, I only put one question, but before going to that question, anybody, we only have two minutes and they're gonna put us back into the, the major um, group. Any questions that you had or anything that you thought was important and I didn't bring it out. Um, I have a question to ask. Would you consider Ellen G. White? Now I know we consider her a prophet, but would we consider her a great person? I do. I do. What does somebody else think? Well, her name sure is known throughout um, Adventism, but even, even in the, that. go ahead. But she's written the, uh, the Great Controversy. I think that book is considered very uh, popular throughout um, Christian Christianity. Christian. Yes. And, and um, the Smithsonian. The Smithsonian <laughs> considers her one of the most influential women of the world of all time. The Smithsonian has named her. So yes, I would consider her great. All right, right um, they're gonna they're gonna um, put us back in thirty six seconds. Let's do a closing prayer in thirty six seconds. Father, we just thank you for your covenant. Help us to grasp it, to have the kind of relationship with you that you want us to have, so that we can realize all of these promises that we have studied today. In Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. Amen. Thank, Thank you, everybody. And we'll see you next week. Oh, and no 